normally I'm speaking either to uh, year nine students in schools or at Betchelom, the Holocaust Center. Uh, I've spoken to over 10,000 children in the past few years. I also speak at U3A round table or wherever. I don't very often actually talk in uh, formerly Christian circles. So um, this is going to be quite an interesting evening, but it's the way you play it that's going to make it interesting. I just want to uh, perhaps take two texts, two verses, to uh, set, set the scene. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. That's Genesis 131. And uh, driving over from Tame this evening, the beauty of the countryside was very good, just uh, marred by a traffic jam, which was from Tame to here. <laughs> and the second verse, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. These two verses, I think, show something that there is something of the tension that there is in the heart of God. And um, in my life, in a little way, I've um, shared something of that tension in my own experiences. So um, I'm a kinder transport child, a refugee from. Germany and Czechoslovakia, coming to this country in uh, July 39 uh, with uh, somebody who you may or may not have heard of, um, Sir Nicholas Winton, mm -hmm. who um, rescued 669 children. Kinder transport. I normally uh, ask for a translation of that, but it's a bit too obvious, isn't it? Child transport. Yeah, in 1938-39, uh, 10,000 Jewish children from uh, various parts of Europe came to UK, USA, Palestine as it then was, and elsewhere. In fact, quite a lot went to uh, mainland China, because China was actually the only one of two countries in the world that kept totally open, bo open borders to Jewish refugees. Um, but it was a bit of a long way off, and most of us had never heard of it. So 10,000 Jewish children um, got out, unaccompanied, for various reasons. Either their parents um, didn't want to leave aged parents of their own behind, or they had a some concerns, or they, uh, I think a lot of people didn't really believe that the terrible things that happened were going to happen. They thought, well, let's get the children out and then things will settle down um, shortly. Uh, how many Jewish people died in the Holocaust? Six million. That's a well known figure. How many of those were? sort of 16 and younger, one and a half million. A quarter of those who died were teenagers and younger. So 10,000 got out, one and a half million didn't. So I'm telling my story in a sense on behalf of the 10,000. There are 10,000 other people, although I was one of the younger ones, not many of the 10,000 are still surviving. I'm telling you my story on behalf of the 10,000. I'm also telling you my story on behalf of the one and a half million who didn't get out. I don't know how many of you have been to Yad Vashem, uh, probably quite a number. Um, the Children's Pyramid, an amazing place. If you haven't been there, it's a blackened pyramid with one and a half million candle flames one for each child who didn't get out. Uh, the uh, secret is actually there are seven candles and a lot of mirrors, but um, one and a half million candle flames and an endless taped loop which takes several days to go around um, with one and a half million names on. And uh, 
If I'm in Jerusalem and get a bit frazzled, and everybody gets a bit frazzled in Jerusalem sometime or other, the place I go for a bit of peace is Yad Vashem and the Children's Memorial. And I sit there and I thought if, uh, if it hadn't been for my parents and for Nicholas Winton, my name would have uh, been um, on that tape. Now, most of us who came out as children, we wanted, you know, children look forward. It's only when we get to our dotage we begin to look back. Uh, we wanted to get a good education, we wanted to get a job, we wanted to get married. You know, we wanted to put the past behind us. And um, I did that. I had, you know, I've got very strong memories, but um, they were pretty well buried. When we got into our 40s and 50s, we um, were too frightened to look back because we had a pretty good understanding of what we would find if we began to dig it's only when we get into our older years that uh, the pressure to look back uh, becomes um, dominant. And for, for all of us in various ways, we have our own ways of, uh, of looking back. But what started for me was um, S. Ranson, That's Life. Now, That's Life is a program that everybody watched and nobody admits to watching. Uh, 28th of February, 1988. My phone rang. A friend of mine, a friend of ours on the phone, Jane. Jane said, John, were you watching That's Life? I said, no, Jane, I sometimes watch, but uh, Elizabeth my wife, uh, and I were just having a quiet Sunday evening and we didn't turn the box on. We just wanted to be quiet this evening. Uh, but why do you ask? And Jane said, well, you were on it. <laughs> now, I know Esther got up to all kinds of tricks. What do you mean I was on it? And Jane said, you know, I photograph you, of, you got the, of yourself as a little boy in a lace collar, and you're permitted to say, ah, <laughs> most, <laughs> most school children do. Uh, you know, I photograph yourself. They, um, they showed that. I said, Jane, I've got the only copy of that photograph in existence. It's locked away in a photograph album. How could Esther Anson have got a hold of it? And uh, Jane said, you know that uh, travel document? Um, they showed you a travel document. I said, I don't know anything about a travel document. But I knew that, I thought up to now this was a bit of a leg pull. But I knew Jane wouldn't pull my leg over this issue. And she said, yeah, they showed your photograph on the, uh, your, your travel document. I said, Jane, what's this about? And she said, well, I don't know anymore. All I know is that um, they gave a, photo, a phone number to phone in if anybody who came on the Kinder Transport with Nicholas Winton could uh, phone in. Oh, uh, none of us heard of Nicholas Winton at the time. We didn't know how we came to this country, those of us who came from Czechoslovakia on that last route. And, um, well... Reluctantly, I phoned the number, expecting, I don't know what, probably the man from the moon answering. But the, the voice at the other end said, um, Esther Hansen speaking, how can I help you? I said, Esther, what is this all about? And she said, well, we've uh, done this program on Kindle Transport. We're waiting to see how many people phone in. So, Look, will you and your wife come down to television studios next Thursday and we'll meet up, depending how many, many other people have phoned in. Then next Sunday, um, we'll, uh, we'll make another programme and uh, you'll meet this man, Nicholas Winton. Well, that was the catalyst. I couldn't leave it any, any longer. I had to start looking back. And... Uh, I realized that if I wasn't careful, this could become very much a poor old me story. 
bit of a sob story. And I didn't want to have do that. Uh, life was good. I, I remember a very good life, at least the first half, with my parents and my brother and a uh, family. Uh, I'd had a wonderful life in England, wonderful foster parents. Uh, I'd had a good job. Uh, I was married, three lovely children, seven grandchildren. What could be better? So I didn't want to make this a sob story. Not just about me. My question really was, how was it possible in such a civilized part of uh, the world as um, Germany, a very civilized country, how was it possible for one man, one small group of people, so to take over um, the country and to take over people's lives, how was it possible that Hitler and the Nazi party could do what they did in that part of Europe? Um, what motivated them, and um, how were they allowed to do it? So, I have to confess that history was not my strong point at school. I didn't enjoy it, um, but how wrong I was, because how important it is. And um, I had to cut into history somewhere, so I, I cut in at the end of World War I. I went to the uh, uh, Balfour, uh, statement that the British government was in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home of Jewish people. Um, that's the well-known part of the Balfour Declaration. But there was another part, that the British government was in favor of protecting the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So where was this when Hitler was doing his thing? Who was protecting the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in Germany and other parts of Europe? Uh, you know, where had this gone? And then there came the um, Versailles Conference. After World War I, the uh, victorious allies, the uh, British, the French, and the Americans, called a conference in uh, Versailles in France. And the um, agenda, or at least part of the agenda, was what to do with Germany. Germany must never be allowed to become a strong country again. Germany must be, well, literally taken to the cleaners. German economy must be destroyed. German industry must be destroyed. German culture must be destroyed. Um, everything German, or valued as German, must be dismantled. And uh, the Allies, the French, the British, and the Americans, were pretty successful in what they did. And uh, what happens when a country uh, undergoes this? At the end of uh, World War I, you're fed up. You want a, a holiday. You want to go to America. So you go to the travel agent and... Uh, the travel agent wants 12 marks for one US dollar, and you have a good holiday in America. A couple of years later, you want to do it again. This time, the travel agent wants something like 7,000 marks for one US dollar. You have a holiday, but not a very good one. In 1923, you want a holiday, and this time, the travel agent wants something like 4 billion marks for one US dollar and your salary hasn't gone up. By the way, the um, economists um, have a word for it. It's called quantitative easing. Um, printing money. And the Germans went into this that it came pretty well like Mickey Mouse money. Let's look at it another way. You want to post a letter in 1919, an inland letter in Germany. You put a five mark stamp on. By the time you get to 1923, you put a 50 billion mark stamp on. It cost a thousand pounds to post an inland letter in Germany in 1923. And government after government after government failed in its attempt to do anything about it. Uh, the uh, Americans who actually 
were not over-involved in World War I until towards the end. Had a bit more sympathy for Germany, perhaps, than Britain or France, who suffered so much. And they lent Germany, actually, quite a lot of dollars in the 1920s, until the big cash came, worldwide economic cash, and the Americans said, oh, we want our money back. And of course, Germany, hadn't, Germany had no money to give back. Um, so along comes this uh, man, Adolf Hitler, who's been uh, waiting in the wings. And he said uh, to the German people, look, I've got the answer. Trust me. Make me your chancellor. I will restore German dignity, economy, uh, education, industry. Let me be your chancellor. I can do it. And in, uh, in 1933, he becomes chancellor. As soon as he became chancellor, he addressed his people. I've made you a promise. I'm going to make Germany great again. Unfortunately, I can't keep my promise unless. Very much a politician statement, isn't it? Uh, I can't make promises and I can't keep them. He said, let's not blame the Americans, not blame the French, not blame the British. They won the war. We can get over that. The real trouble in Germany, in fact, it's a, it's a problem, trouble worldwide. It's the Jews. If we're going to make Germany great again, we've got to get rid of the Jews. And uh, the German people, just so downtrodden, said, well, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. So in January, Hitler becomes chancellor. In March, already the first anti-Jewish riots in Berlin. In May, the public burning of Jewish books. In October, all Berlin hospitals free of Jewish doctors. And in fact, in 1933-34, 400 of the best German doctors came to this country. Germany's loss was Britain's gain. So that's the background. It's against that background that I want to tell my story. Um, I was born, well, my, my mother was born pretty well in a little uh, big village of uh, Witkov near Opava, pretty well if you look on the Slovak, Czech, Polish border. Of course, then Czechoslovakia was, was uh, one country, not two. Um, her father was a big doctor in the area. Um, he was a medical officer of health for quite a large part of central Czechoslovakia. Uh, my mother um, wanted to become a professional photographer. So where do you study uh, photography? Well, in, um, in Berlin, in, uh, in Dresden. So she went to Dresden as a student. Uh, there she met the man who was to become my father, uh, my elder brother was born in Dresden in 1928. I was due to be born in 1931. And actually, Dresden was already a city in riot. It was a dangerous place, not just for Jews, but uh, communists, uh, Jews, a lot of minorities. It, it was just a, not the kind of city that one would want to have a baby in, especially if one was Jewish. So she went back to her parents in Czechoslovakia. I was born there. And uh, then we went back to Dresden to join my father and my brother. So uh, I have dual nationality. That's our house in Witkov. Uh, that's where my grandparents lived. Uh, lovely house, big house. Uh, still there. I've been back several times. And now divided into four apartments. Um, just a few. Uh, that's a fairly recent photograph. Uh, that's my mother, uh, training to be a photographer. In, in modern parlance, I think that's a selfie. Um, uh, part of her final degree portfolio, but it's a, it's a lovely photograph. That's our flat in Dresden. Behind the red car is our front door to the right. Um, the two windows to the right on the ground floor are our apartment in Dresden. Um, it's a more recent photograph. Uh, I normally get um, children to try and tell me why that's a more recent photograph. <laughs> and of course, the answer is the satellite dish, <laughs> which actually few of them actually spot. 
Um, we didn't have a satellite dish in the 1930s. <laughs> but um, uh, that's my father. I'm in my father's arms. My elder brother, Arthur, is lower down in Czechoslovakia in 1932. We were a good, happy family, and everything was going pretty well. My father was actually a buyer in ladies' fashion for one of the big Dresden stores. My mother was a photographer. Uh, that's in our back garden, a garden big enough to toboggan in. Uh, as I remember it, we had real winters and real summers, but that's probably a childhood memory. Uh, that's me wrapped in a blanket uh, in a carpet on a sledge uh, with my brother. So you can see that life was good. That's in Dresden near the zoo. Uh, that's our first car in Dresden. And you can see that my brother and I are wearing pretty fashionable clothes of boys for the 1930s. Um, but that's my first day at school in Dresden. Um, I'm still wearing that lace collar. I think it's so around my neck. Anybody tell me what I'm holding in my right arm? Somebody knows. Who knows? Yes, uh, it uh, In uh, Germany, the first day of school, every child um, gets one of those cones and it's full of toffees and chocolates and sweets. And I've got another photograph of myself carrying three of those. <laughs> and I'm still working on it. <laughs> That's our school in Dresden, right from kindergarten up to um, sixth form, or year, whatever it is these days. Uh, you may be wondering, because it's generally told that uh, Dresden was totally destroyed by the RAF Lancasters in a big firestorm in 1945, which is 99 point something percent true. But there's a little area in southeastern Dresden suburbs that somehow the firestorm must have divided and joined up again. And that's exactly where we lived. And that part of Dresden is like a time capsule. And now it's exactly as we left it in 1938. So much so that behind the flats were, there were new flats then, new apartments, and um, behind, lots of young families, behind the flats, big children's play areas, sand, big sand pits, swings, roundabouts, the lot. And that's my brother and I in 1935, sitting on a seat, Beside a sandpit, probably big enough for about 18 children to, to play in. And after school and in the holidays, we all played in it. And then one day in 1935, suddenly in the middle of the game, all the other children turned on my brother and me, and they started spitting at us. They started kicking us. They started punching us. And they started calling us dirty Jews. I mean, I hardly knew what a Jew was. We weren't a religious Jewish family. My father probably went to synagogue once a year, twice a year. Um, we felt thoroughly German. We'd been well integrated. Uh, a lot of our family friends were non-Jewish Germans. It got on well. In fact, that went on day after day so badly that in the end, my brother ran into our flat, which is uh, just off to the left of that picture. And he brought out my father's iron cross, which my father had won in World War I for his bravery fighting for Germany. And you can't get much more German than that. But it made no impact at all on the others. The kicking, the spitting, the name calling just went on. And in 1935, 100,000 German children um, swore eternal enmity toward Jewish people. And that's a class in a Dresden school, 1935. You can see most of the children are wearing Hitler Youth uniforms. There's a boy at the front, there's a boy on the extreme left, there's a boy at the back, not in Hitler Youth uniforms. Three Jewish boys in a class of Hitler Youth. And the teacher was not in uniform, but he would have been um, SS or Gestapo vetted. 
otherwise you wouldn't have been allowed to teach. And the, school, the schools developed a bullying policy, not an anti-bullying policy, which most English schools have. The policy was you can bully a Jewish child as much as you like. And not only the teachers not stop it, they actually took part in it. So that was, you, could, you know, that earlier picture of me going to school looking very, very happy and pleased with myself. All those other pictures, suddenly life had a big change. I said we were not a particularly religious family. In fact, my father's best friend was a big Dresden businessman, a Gentile businessman, and his wife. They had two boys the same age as my brother and me, and we used to go and visit them quite often. Our parents had tea together with the uh, other parents, and the four boys played together, and then the same thing happened. The other two boys started pin um, thumping and kicking and name-calling and spitting. And my father's best friend joined the SS. Life began to get dangerous. Uh, I was one day, I remember, I was having a, a tickling match with my father in our front room. And um, I was squirming so much that I hit my head on a central heating radiator and I cut my head open. And uh, he took me off to our family doctor. Uh, family doctors, you know, he'd been our family doctor for a long time. Nice man, a good man. Doctors mainly are. And I distinctly remember him looking at this cut, and he said, that needs a stitch. And then he paused and added, but I don't stitch Jews. And he put a plaster on, and I've got a scar, which is rapidly disappearing amongst the horizontal wrinkles. <laughs> so um, life got pretty bad. Um, Outside the German towns, villages, these signs appear. Jews are unwelcome guests in this town. We weren't guests. We lived there. This was our home. And suddenly we became guests, and suddenly we became unwelcome guests. And in the shops, Jews are not served in this shop. I remember Hitler's visit to Dresden in 1936. Uh, Dresden dressed over all in all the Nazi regalia. Um, obviously, as a Jewish family, we didn't go and listen to him. But um, the Germans are very good engineers. And all over Dresden, these huge loudspeakers, nowhere, even indoors, could you escape that voice. And uh, Hitler's voice about the Juden, the Juden, the Juden. If any of you were to say the Jews in a slightly raised voice, I wouldn't hear your voice, I would hear his. His voice is locked away in this computer and I can't find the off switch. Uh, then uh, came the um, Evian Conference in 1938. The world leaders, President Roosevelt called the world leaders together to a conference in France. Uh, the gender, what should we do about the Jewish problem? I think it might have been more accurate if he'd said, what should we do about the Nazi problem? But what should we do about the Jewish problem? Up to, by this time, most countries in the world, nearly all countries, had closed the door to any further Jewish immigration. We were stuck. And Hitler's representatives at the conference said, uh, went back to him and said, you can do what you like with the Jews. The world does not want to know. Because the world leaders at Evian said, what should we do about the Jewish problem? What can we do about the Jewish problem? Nothing. And they went home. And uh, Hitler now felt free. He had a free hand. Things got so bad that in uh, um, middle of one night, my um, parents put my brother and me in the back of the car. We just slammed the door on the flat left everything behind. We didn't want to create any suspicion. We drove through the night to Czechoslovakia. The border guards let us across because we weren't carrying any luggage. We didn't create any suspicion about running away. We went to my mother's parents' home, and there we felt totally free again. 
Czechoslovakia was a wonderful country. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, going to meet with Hitler in Germany and signing a document, Peace in Our Time. And Hitler saying, just let me have this narrow strip of northern Czechoslovakia called Sudetenland, where a lot of German people lived. Um, Sudetenland, it had been South German lands. Hitler said, just let me have these back, and then there will be peace. So they signed this document, Peace in Our Time. And um, everybody thought, well, well, everybody outside Central Europe, everybody outside the Jewish community thought, Peace in Our Time, wonderful. The uh, British government made the Czech government um, stand its army down so as not to resist the uh, invasion of um, Sudetenland. Hitler came into Sudetenland. And I remember the German, that's where we lived, I remember the German tanks, the cavalry, the infantry marching in. But of course they didn't stop at Sudetenland. They took the whole of Czechoslovakia and then attacked Poland. And uh, the British Prime Minister realized he'd been duped. So things got bad again. I remember one day uh, I was helping my father uh, in our big orchard, cutting down a diseased fruit tree, um, probably a plum tree, I don't remember. But um, we were cutting the tree down and we were aware of hev heavy footsteps in the garden. We looked up and there was a jackbooted SS officer walking up our garden path. <laughs> Why are you cutting the tree down? Well, it's diseased, officer. It's diseased. It's got to come down. What do you mean it's diseased? He knew nothing about fruit trees. He had only one purpose. He wanted a game. And his idea of a game was to bully a Jew. And I remember standing beside my father during an SS interrogation over, allegedly over the tree, but the tree had no further purpose. It was just an exercise in bullying just for the fun of it. And that sort of began to spread. Our car was confiscated and life again became pretty intolerable. One day my father called my brother and me and said, um, sit down boys, you're going on a long journey. You're going to a country called England. We can't come with you. You've got to go alone. Uh, I was seven, my brother was ten. You've got to go alone. But when the troubles are over, you can come back, or maybe we can come to England. But just for the moment, you just have to go alone. And my mother took this last photograph of us outside our house. Then they took it down to the railway station. They put us on a train and said goodbye. As the train was leaving, my mother took her wristwatch off and passed it through the window to me and said, just, just remember us by that. And off went the train. Um, we ha had no idea where the train was going. Um, I, I'm not sure whether my parents had an accurate idea where the train may be going. But this was happening all over Europe. Parents putting their children on a train and the hopes that they would end up somewhere safe. That uh, train actually took us back into Germany, to Hanover, to a big, uh, it had been, this place had been a big Jewish horticultural college um, with links to Palestine, but now it was a dispersal camp for Jewish children. It was a very orthodox, very strict. Um, every morning before breakfast, we had PE. And that photograph is before breakfast. And I'm on that photograph somewhere to the right, my brother's somewhere to the left. Uh, the girls are in the back. And um, 
When I try and enlarge it, it gets too blurred to actually find myself, but I'm there somewhere. And uh, day by day, children were taken down to Hanover Station and put on various refugee trains going to various parts of the world. And one day, a um, teacher took my brother and me to the station and put us on a train, which had actually, we didn't know then, originated in Prague, um, one of the Winton trains. And um, that train took us, um, in fact, that, that his trains normally didn't go via Hanover, but uh, he must have diverted the train to, uh, to pick my brother and me up. Um, well, that's the background. I was fostered into a lovely, a wonderful Christian family. Um, my brother was in a, another foster, in, in Sheffield, my brother was in another foster home nearby. And um, life was good. Um, again, we can talk about life there. Uh, but after the Esther Hansen program, I had to find out what happened to the family I'd left behind. And uh, my wife and I and our children went back to Germany and Czechoslovakia because we were just looking for records, looking for anything we could find. Here we are in uh, most of the synagogues. The synagogues of Prague were now more historic places and uh, with lots of records. And here am I. Uh, in one of the synagogues in Prague with uh, our youngest son, David, um, with a good 1992 student haircut. <laughs> so, what, what have I found? What have I found? Well, we went back to Dresden. I found the sandpit. And as I sat on that sandpit in 1993, all those memories from mid in 30s came flooding back. Well, these are, these are my family from my mother's side. Back row, left to right, my mother, my father. My grandfather, the doctor, then in front of him, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, um, he was a hundred by then, but he had been a fireman on a horse-drawn fire engine. In fact, he had a firefighting business, I think. Um, he was one of my favorites, my great-grandfather. And then front row right is my brother and me. And on the left of it shows our, our lovely dog. Um, for 40 years... I hadn't dared to look to try and find out what had happened to these people. And uh, this is what I found. Oh, I, I was actually Hans Heine Feiger as a boy, which translates fairly easily into John Henry Fields End. Well, the Fields End doesn't translate easy, but, but the Hans Heine, John Henry. Um, but my father, Kurt, my mother, Trudy, I found they were interned in Auschwitz, 26th of February. 1943. The date of death is not recorded. My grandfather, the doctor, Samuel, grandfather Samuel, interned in Theresienstadt on these dates, this date. He died there in December, uh, December 43. Theresienstadt was a transit camp for Auschwitz, but he died before the transit. But my grandmother, Rosa, uh, and turned in Dresden, transferred to Auschwitz. Uh, the Nazis, this is part of the German Nazi mentality, is to keep accurate records. Everything done must be recorded. Even these terrible things. Uh, take your, again, on a, imagine, just horrible imagination, but imagine you're a worker in Auschwitz or any other camp. You have breakfast with your wife and family, make sure the kids go to school, go to work. In the morning, you put a hundred people in a gas chamber, have lunch. In the afternoon, you shoot another 50. Then you go home and select your, schools, your kids from school, play with them, have a nice supper. Next day, you do it again. And everything has to be recorded. 
because they were so sure that they were doing the right thing. This is part of the mentality. And um, when the Russian army liberated Auschwitz, the uh, Nazis, uh, the uh, workers, put as many records as possible in the uh, um, crematoria, and especially the death records, because they wanted to cover their traces um, after the Russians came in. So although one and a half million or more people died in Auschwitz, only 80,000 complete records um, have survived. Uh, my grandmother, um, or my great-grandmother, rather, better, interned in Dresdenstadt and died there. And this is one of my deep questions. I have tried to put myself in a Nazi shoes. How would I go about doing what I wanted to do? And I come up to the question, was it really necessary to put a 90-year-old woman into a camp? What kind of mentality uh, makes that possible? I, I don't know. On uh, my mother's sister, Mariana, uh, and Uncle Willem and uh, their son, Paul, that same journey, Dresdenstadt, Auschwitz. Uh, my father's mother, um, taken across the border from Germany to Theresienstadt, which is near Prague, where she died. Uh, my father's sister, Erna, uh, Aunt Erna, and Uncle Moritz, and their daughter, Gerda, were taken right across Germany, across Poland, to Riga Stutthof, um, where there was a camp. And from Riga Stutthof, um, Jews were taken to Gdansk, where the um, German Baltic battle fleet was stationed. And battleships take a lot of servicing, cleaning, <coughs> repairing, rearming, refueling. A job normally done by dock workers and uh, the sailors. But uh, the Germans had other ideas. They did all these things with Jewish slave labor. And my aunt, my uncle, and my cousin Gerda died in slave labor, servicing the German Baltic battle fleet. Gerda's brother, Harry, uh, was taken from there to Bergen-Belsen. And actually, he survived, survived Bergen-Belsen and uh, went to America um, after the war. Uh, this is um, Les and Vera, uh, my foster parents. When I came to England, I went to Sheffield. And uh, we were able, uh, which is their, their son, John, who became like a brother to me. And uh, we were able, uh, in the uh, just intervening weeks, to send back some photographs to my parents uh, to assure them that um, we had uh, arrived safely and were with a good family. That must have been a, a real uh, comfort to them. Um, now, the Jewish Refugee Committee um, in the war, once the, once the refugee thing had settled, the um, Jewish Refugee Committee started... Uh, contacting all families, because m most Jewish children were actually uh, fostered in non-Jewish families. And they started contacting and insisting that, um, you know, we, we went to a Jewish school. So for a while, I was at this uh, Jewish school on Hindhead Heath between Hazelby and Hindhead. Uh, Stodley Rough School. I have to say, it wasn't a rough school. <laughs> but in, uh, in Surrey, in that part of Surrey, a plot of land on which a house is built is called a rough. The house was called Stotley, and so the school was Stotley Rough School. Um, a small, um, fairly easygoing co-ed boarding school, everything a sort of boy dreams of. Um, in the middle is Dr. Leon, our headmistress. The headmistress was Dr. Leon, the lion, and the deputy head was Dr. Wolf, the wolf. <laughs> And uh, the senior mistress was Dr. Laven the fox. So we were looked after by the lion, the wolf, and the fox. <laughs> but um, pastorally, it was an excellent school. Pastorally. Educationally, lacking a lot. But pastorally, a very good school. 
And when I move amongst my sort of refugee brothers and sisters, I can pretty well pick out those who went to that school because uh, I think we have a, a sense of um, wholeness which a lot of the other children haven't got. So I don't want to criticize the school. Pastorally, it was excellent. But I'm showing a photograph because in the middle on the left is a boy who is about 15 years old. On the extreme right is his sister in a short-sleeved white blouse and a sleeveless pullover. They weren't kinder transport. Most of the other children were either kinder transport or younger. That boy and that girl had only just come to England after World War II. Um, they had survived the Warsaw Ghetto by living down a sewer, a rat-infested sewer, uh, by day, and coming up at night to just to get a few scraps of food, and by dawn going down the sewer again. And they survived. And how they survived, I don't know. And they came to England and joined us, and uh, they were such lovely people. How? I just don't know. I suppose I do know, really. And I think you know, too. Um, but uh, after, the, um, after the end of World War II, um, the Jewish Refugee Committee started uh, co uh, contacting us uh, refugees, uh, especially those of us who had lived in non-Jewish homes, to make sure we had a Jewish education and to make sure we had a bar mitzvah. And in 19, which is sort of, you know, the Jewish coming of age, age 13, by now most of us are 15 because we'd lagged behind during the war. But um, I was prepared for bar mitzvah. Now, I had been in a good evangelical Christian home. Nothing was pushed at me. But uh, I was seven when I came. Uh, my foster father was a Sunday school superintendent, and they were regular in church on uh, Sundays. Uh, they couldn't leave me behind while they went to church. I was only seven. So I'd been a churchgoer. I'd been to Sunday school. And now I was in a Jewish situation. And um, I was confused. So just before my bar mitzvah, um, I said to the Jewish Refugee Committee, um, please, this was t toward the end of a summer term, please give me time in the summer holidays. I want to work this through. I want to know what I want. I want to know whether it's bar mitzvah or whether it's baptism. Um, not a popular thing to say. So um, the Jewish Refugee Committee, uh, Bloomsbury House, arranged for me to see Rabbi Wiesenberg in Sheffield and um, on a set day in August, I went to Sheffield to see Rabbi Wiesenberg and um, his wife answered the door and she said, what do you want? I said, I've come to see the rabbi. I have an appointment with him. And she sort of blinked. He must have forgotten he's gone out for the day. So I went back home, somewhat deflated, and uh, I wrote to the Jewish Refugee Committee, um, please can you rearrange the meeting? Because I really wanted to meet the rabbi and I wanted to sort things out. I suppose I was more serious about this than most 15-year-olds would have been. And uh, I got back a letter from the Jewish Refugee Committee. Uh, no, we're not going to re rearrange it. Um, we're withdrawing all responsibility for you. Goodbye. It was a strange reaction. And it really confused me because I'd been, I'd been rejected by Germans because I was Jewish. And now I was being objected by the Jewish Refugee Committee because I even, th even vaguely thinking about becoming a Christian. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I got a big spade and just buried the whole lot. Goodbye. I'm going to start a life from the beginning again. And I just put the whole thing behind me. Um, but uh, 
it took me 18 months actually to make the decision for baptism and uh, actually baptized in 47 and um, it took a, a lot to actually get back into the English educational system because certainly Raf had got a German educational system. I'd been at, at grammar school before I went to Stoetli Raf, but I couldn't go back there because um, I hadn't, got, hadn't done the right things. Fortunately, the local technical college um, started a course of catch-up for ex-servicemen. So I, I joined that and we um, got to the point where we get um, matriculation and then I was able to go back to the grammar school, get high school certificate. Went to Nottingham University, uh, got a degree in electrical engineering. Did two years as a engineer in the Royal Air Force. Uh, there's some interesting experiences there as well. Then. Um, in my time, I was beginning to have a feeling towards ordination. But I, it wasn't clear, so I did a year in industry, um, electronic research and development. Um, I wanted to do electromedical research, something useful with my life. But um, all the money, the government money, was now going into weapons research. And I ended up being on the design team of Blue Streak the intercontinental missile, um, which actually none of us enjoyed. And uh, during that time, my call to ordination was confirmed. And uh, it was interesting. I went um, to see my team leader to hand my notice in. He assumed I was going to some other job in electronics. And I said, you may not understand this, but uh, I'm going to be ordained. And he said two words, which I won't repeat in this room. Uh, and he said, you are the third that's gone that way. And out of that small team, three of us ended up as a, in Christian ministry. And we've met a fourth uh, since then. Not a, totally unknown to one another. And um, I ended up as ordained in uh, Manchester. Then I ended up in a place which I had tried to avoid at all costs, but God always wins, in a little, in a, in a village in Shropshire, <clears throat> where I thought there were more sheep than people. <laughs> um, I ended up as, um, as vicar there, and in a very, very non-Jewish place, in the middle of, um, I think, late 60s, early 70s, I just woke up one morning and out of the blue, hey, I'm Jewish. How on earth have I got here? <laughs> and I went into total personality disintegration. I just fell totally apart. I didn't know who I was, where I was, what was, and uh, it was just a dark tunnel experience. And uh, the family was wonderful. The church actually was wonderful. It was one of the few churches in this country, and uh, probably a handful, that said, hey, we've got a Jewish vicar, isn't that good? And um, I'd met a, 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 a Christian psychotherapist, Dr. Frank Lake, with whom I'd been training as a counselor. And I went to him, and I'm no longer a counselor, a trainee, but as, a, as one of his patients. I said, Frank, do what you like. Put me together. Tell me who I am. Or let me find out who I am. And for several months of sheer pain, I came out of that dark tunnel. Um, still a Christian vicar, but a Messianic Jewish Christian vicar. Um, the term, I hadn't heard the term Messianic Jewish, which wasn't around in this country. Um, but that's who I am. And... Um, if you go to Liverpool Street Station today, there's a group there of kinder transport, because that's where we ended up. Then we met Nicholas Winton. Um, he's going to be 105 in, uh, on Sunday. I'm going to do his 105th birthday party. Um, he lives in Maidenhead. 
to tell you just a little bit about him. In 1938-39, he and a friend, he was a stockbroker, 27 year old, beginning of a wealthy career. No involvement in politics or anything international, just the beginning of a good stockbroking career. Um, he and his friend heard what was happening in Czechoslovakia. They cancelled a skiing holiday in, uh, in Switzerland, went to Prague. Um, that had been a, book, a sort of set up a little table in the foyer of a hotel in Prague. Let it be known amongst the Jewish community that they were concerned to get Jewish children out of Czechoslovakia to England. Uh, Jewish parents contacted him. Um, he booked uh, Czech trains. He got homes in this country. He got finally permission from the Home Office to bring a thousand Czech Jewish children uh, unaccompanied by their parents. And all the time he was being tailed by the Nazis. Um, and uh, we met him on the Esther Ransom program. On the second one, he, he gave me this travel permit. I said, Nicholas, um, shouldn't this travel permit be somewhere in the vaults for the Home Office? He said, your travel permit is in the vaults for the Home Office. I said, what are you giving me? He said, oh, this is a forgery. I said, you got me to England on a forgery. Am I an illegal immigrant? And he said, no, I only use... He said, the British government were just so slow in providing me with travel documents. Your parents had entrusted you to me. I'd got you a seat on a train. I'd got your foster parents in England. The only thing I hadn't got was a um, travel pass. What could I do? I set up a printing press and I started printing my own. <laughs> and used those to get us through Germany. He risked his life doing something which he had no involvement in, needed to have no involvement in. Um, he gave up a career to do it. Um, that's Nicholas. So I think I'm going to pull. Um, I'm going to pause. Uh, I haven't quite finished, but probably a good pause to see any questions coming up. I don't mind to say. Take it from where you like. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll read this letter, then I'll give you a, a few minutes of buzz time. Okay? Um, as, after the war, first of all, my brother and I received a big parcel from Czechoslovakia through the International Aid Course. Somebody had been in our house, I don't know who, found these photograph albums, nothing to do with them, most people had ignored it. Whoever it was picked up these albums, looked at them and said, these are, these are important to somebody. I don't know who, these are important to somebody. Gave them to an International Red Cross office and said, find the owner. And the International Red Cross did his work. And then another way, um, my brother and I received this letter a farewell letter from my parents just before they were taken to Auschwitz. And my mother wrote, Dear boys, when you receive this letter, the war will be over. We won't, our messenger won't be able to send it earlier. We want to say farewell to you, who are our dearest possession in the world. And only for a short time were we able to keep you. Fate has not left us for months now. In January 1942, the violas were taken we still don't know where to or whether they're still alive. In June, Grandmother Betty. In September, Aunt Marion, Uncle William, Paulie. In October, your Steiner grandparents. In November, your 90-year-old great-grandmother. In December, it will be our turn. And the time has therefore come for us to turn to you again and to ask you to become good men. And think of the years we were happy together. We're going into the unknown not a word is to be heard from those already taken. Thank those who have kept you from a similar fate. You took, of course, a piece of your poor parents' hearts with you when we decided to give you away. 
give our thanks and gratitude to all who are good to you. And Father added, your dear mother has told you about the hard fate of all our loved ones. We too will not be spared and will go bravely into the unknown with the hope that we shall yet see you again when God wills. Don't forget us and be good. I too thank all the good people who've accepted you so nobly. What a wonderful letter from wonderful parents knowing that within days of writing it they would end up in Auschwitz. Um, I've tried to be good, I haven't always succeeded. But um, I've given you the potted version, the longer versions in the book. <laughs>